Welcome to the Widowed Mom Podcast, Episode 202, Widows Unfiltered, an interview with Jess Pirakoski. Welcome to the Widowed Mom Podcast, the only podcast that offers a proven process to help you work through your grief, to grow, evolve, and create a future you can truly look forward to. Here's your host, Master Certified Life Coach, Grief Expert, Widow, and Mom, Krista St. Germain. Hey there. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm recording this intro for the third time because I keep crying. (laughs) So I'm going to try not to cry this time. Here's the thing. I have these interviews and then I record the intro later. So I just did this interview with Jess and... It's just really humbling to me, and I'm really, really grateful that I have a job where I get to help women when they are at a terribly low point in their lives, and I get to give them tools that they can use to help themselves and that they can use to help their children and that they can use long after we're done coaching together. And even though I'm doing this work all day long, there's something about hearing about it from someone else and then sitting back and reflecting on it. And I just still kind of have to pinch myself sometimes that this is what I get to do. And I still wouldn't have asked that Hugo die so that I get to do it. I still wish that, you know, that the accident hadn't happened, but since it did, here we are. Right. And I'm really grateful to my past self for what I did after he died and what I have created since he died and how I help other women since he died. And I'm really grateful to people like Jess who are willing to invest in themselves and do scary hard things because they want to be the best parent that they can be. And even when it's not easy and it requires time and effort and discomfort, they're willing to do it and to show up for themselves. So I will stop rambling. The good news is that I didn't cry (laughs) this time. I hope you enjoy my interview with Jess. All right. Welcome, Jess, to the podcast. I'm glad to have you. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We were talking before I pressed record, and I was just saying that. Like, I don't think we ever get enough stories, at least for me. And it's interesting, too, that we were also talking about before we started that you just turned 40 because that was the age I was when Hugo died. Like, I just remember thinking nobody in my world relates to this. So I love that you're willing to come and tell your story so other people can hear it and feel like less alone. So thank you for that. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. Let me have you introduce yourself first. So tell us a little bit about you, how you came to this whole widowed experience, anything anything you want to know. Yeah. Well, I'm Jess Pirikoski, just turned 40. I've got two young boys. They just turned six and eight. And yeah, my wife, Sarah, passed away November of 2021, completely unexpected. She started having, she complained of a headache one night, Thursday night, which was unusual for her to get headaches, but complained of a headache. And then a couple hours later started throwing up and we're like, oh man, you've got the stomach bug, you know, that's Mm -hmm. going around like, you know, that stinks. And so she just kind of continued to routinely every couple hours, like in the bathroom, vomiting, just didn't feel well. So through the next day, you know, she stayed home from work. I got the boys off to school. I went to work and, you know, checked on her, how you doing? And she'd be like, well, I feel like I got hit by a Mack truck, you know, like I can't eat anything, nothing stays down. And so it was like that whole day, just in the bathroom, vomiting to the point where like nothing would come out, but still going through the motions. And then by Saturday morning, still feeling that way and really like lethargic and took her to the emergency room. And um, it wasn't until we got into the car that she kind of started talking a little funny. It wasn't quite making sense. But we get to the ER and I walk her, she walked in with me, walk her in, I supported her, sat down, checked her in, and they came out to have her sign some papers. And she just wasn't like, really coherent and so they called a code stroke took her back right away tried asking her questions kind of got back around for me and they took her down to get a CT immediately and I was sitting in that trauma room and they wheeled her back in and he said she's got a massive brain bleed 
And so she had suffered a hemorrhagic stroke. And at that point, like they did an emergency craniotomy. And I mean, at that point, the neurologist had said, like, if she makes it through the surgery, she would need 24 hour care. And so it was just like the, the bottom dropping out. I mean, I could not figure out, like, she literally just walked in here with me. Like, she walked, you know, to the car. Like, she was just talking to me. How does she have this yeah. massive brain bleed? So then it was just, we were in the hospital for nine days because I made a decision. I knew that she, we had had, had a conversation of organ donation. So it was uh, sitting in the hospital going through all that process. But knowing that, you know, that was all the time we had left was. Was that time in so the hospital? So she was healthy. healthy yeah, yeah, healthy. And, you know, for me, it was hard because, like, you know, the things you hear about stroke, like, you know, face paralysis, like numbness, you know, anything like that. I mean, it was, she complained of a headache and was throwing up and to walk in the ER and 20 minutes later find out that she's just got this brain bleed and nothing can be done was, yeah, yeah, unreal. And I assume there was like no health issues that you had been watching nope. or were even aware yep. of. Yep. She was, she was completely healthy, had no issues, nothing at all. Had just had like a, her yearly checkup and everything was mm -hmm. good. So just came out of nowhere. You don't know, I have no idea why or how it happened, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And how long were you together? We were together for 11 years, married for six because we weren't mm -hmm. allowed to get married until they... Mm -hmm. The law passed in, in 2015, yeah. so 2016. Mm -hmm. Yep, 11 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So not that anybody ever likes like really remembering it, but I, I just think it's, there's value in talking about it. Like those early days, what was that like for you? What do you remember? I think the biggest thing that I remember is coming home from the hospital after she had finally passed. and. My boys were in school. I had made sure to keep them in school to try to keep things as normal for them as possible at that time. Mm -hmm. And like coming home and standing in the living room and saying like, wow, this is what it feels like to be numb. Like I had yes. heard people say they felt numb before. And it was like, just was like, I was living someone else's life. Not mm -hmm. like, you know, just not this world. Yeah. And it was, it was hard. I mean, it was a blur. Like I wanted, I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to do anything, but I had a four and a six year old, um, mm -hmm. who still needed to have someone mm -hmm. there for them. So it yeah. was, I mean, they were, I've, I've said, I've told people like they, they were the light in my darkness. Like they were the reason why I would try to put one foot in front of the other. And cause you know, they still had to live. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's yeah. like, it's like watching a weird movie. Yep. Yeah. A out of body experience completely, you know? Yeah. And definitely not even knowing that it's real yet, like feeling like, okay, at any time I can wake up now. And she'll be back. Yeah. 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 yeah I wonder, I always come up with the random questions on the fly, right? I just noticed lately some women and mom goes on kind of judging themselves harshly for how they responded in those early hours and days. Was there any of that for you or were you pretty supportive to yourself? I don't remember really judging myself early on, honestly, because I think I was, there was just so much that had to be done mm -hmm. and so much care for the boys that like, it was just, this is what I have to do. You know, yeah. I think that if it weren't for the boys being there and at the age they were, where they weren't as independent, mm -hmm. I know that I would have like not gotten out of bed. And so mm -hmm. I bet, I think then I would have had a lot of judgment there, but. Yeah. And it's interesting how our body tries to protect us from all of the intense emotion mm -hmm. and it's so different for each person, right? So it sounds like for you, it was numbness. That's kind of how it felt to me too, is like I was able mm -hmm. to go through the motions and get things done and have the conversations that I needed to have but just all the while feeling like this can't possibly be actually my life. Whereas, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just everybody's responses are different. I guess what I, I wish more people knew is that it's okay to respond however you respond and that you're right. doing the best you can. And sometimes it might not be the way you expect that 
you would respond, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. That doesn't mean it's anything to feel badly about or be ashamed Mm -hmm. of. And I've just Mm -hmm. noticed some women lately in conversations that I'm having that are just really beating the crap out of themselves for Mm -hmm. how they think they should have handled it. Sure. Like they're like, there's a right way or something. Right. Yeah. 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 Before Sarah died, what did you know about grief? Did you know much? Did you? Not really. I mean, I had had a grandmother, my Nana, who passed away when I was in middle school. And that was really hard for me. I was really close to her. I remember like not speaking for quite a while, but I didn't have, especially as an adult, I didn't really have anything that would compare to this intensity Mm -hmm. except for like imagining what it might be like, you know, Mm -hmm. like having that fear that something might happen and Mm -hmm. what that would feel like, but definitely did not have anything comparable, anything close to this at all. Where did you go first for resources or support? You know, Sarah's family was actually very supportive. Her mom had been a widowed mom herself way Mm -hmm. back when she had had three kids. And so, like, it was amazing that here she lost her daughter yet could, you know, was still there to tell me, like, I remember, you know, feeling A, B or C. And also Sarah's sister had lost one of her kids shortly after she was born. And so Mm -hmm. she was so familiar with that intense grief. And so Mm -hmm. that was like huge for me. But I I wrote, I've never been a huge writer, but I wrote to just get like a lot of the emotions out. I skied, it was winter time here. So I would get the boys to school, to daycare. I didn't work at that time. Mm -hmm. And I just made myself go out and ski so that I could just have some way to try and get emotions out. Was skiing a time of kind of like escaping in a healthy way or was skiing a time where you could actually think about it, feel it? What was that for you? It was both. It was both. It was a, it was a way to escape. And then it was just a way to like, yeah, help just feel, you know, Mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah. Yep. And And there's so much value in both. Yeah. And just like, feeling something other than you know because it was strenuous and I like pushed hard and so feeling Mm. something different it was just like I can feel something different right now like a way Mm -hmm. to step away Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. yeah I've talked about on the podcast before but I always think it's worth saying over and over and over like really truly I'm a fan of the dual process theory of grief which the main idea behind it is like there's kind of two buckets of activities there's like grief related activities and then there's non grief related activities and mm-hmm. oscillation is really healthy and healing mm-hmm. is intentionally thinking about your loss and feeling the feelings and dealing with it but also really really valuable is intentionally not thinking about it and doing other things like mm-hmm. for you that sounds like skiing fit that And I I wish more people bought into that because they seem to give themselves like all or nothing. Like I've got to think about all the time and do nothing else. If I do something else, I'm doing it wrong or I'm ignoring my grief or I'm denying it or some such nonsense as opposed to, no, like we can think about it. And then also we need some healthy distraction. It's really valuable Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. different reasons. So yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I remember you said that you listened to a ton of podcast episodes. How'd you find the podcast? Yeah, I honestly can't remember exactly like what I searched for, but I was just, you know, got to a point, it was about eight months in where, you know, I had gotten past those really intense beginning parts of it. And um, Mm -hmm. I just knew that I needed something and like therapy just didn't fit for me. I'm a pretty private person. Therapy just wasn't feeling like what I needed. I needed something and I was... I was pretty much at the bottom, needed to do something. And it wasn't even for me, it was for my boys. I knew like they had lost one mom, they had lost part of another, and like they deserved the best of me. And in order Mm -hmm. to give them the best of me, I need to, you know, do this, navigate this the best way that I can. So I searched, I don't even know what I searched and your podcast came up. Were you a podcast listener before? No. Kind of no. You, oh, no. Okay. No, no. Yeah. Right. So I don't even, yeah, I don't even, I was trying to think about that. Like, how did I ever stumble up, like stumble upon it? I don't even know, but I did. Mm. And so I listened and that what I would end up doing then is when I would go for a ski sometimes as I would listen while I was skiing and everything just resonated, you know, like made sense. Like this is exactly 
you know, what I'm feeling or Mm -hmm. this makes sense. And I just realized that I need to take it a step further and, you know, put some time in so that I can, I can be the best I can be for the boys. Mm -hmm. You must not have listened for too long before you came to mom goes on, because if Sarah died in November Mm -hmm. and you, you said you started listening to the podcast eight months later ish. Mm -hmm. And then you you were in our August group. Yep. Yep. So yeah, must have happened. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't even know which one I started listening to, but it resonated. And so then I started with number one and then, yeah, like if I was doing something and could have my headphones in, I Mm -hmm. would just, you know, go to the next one, go to the next one. Mm -hmm. Just kept, yeah. Kept listening. Mm -hmm. What, What were some of the main issues or changes that you really hoped you could use the program to work through? You know, I, at that point, I was just very robotic. Everything, yeah. I felt overwhelmed with having to just be this solo parent now. And I did not feel like the same person I was. Like I kept saying, like they lost, the boys lost both their moms. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not who I was. So I just wanted to try to get back to me the best that I could. Mm-hmm. And I know that at that's, I will never be the same person that I was, but I wanted to get as close to that as I could. And just some of the stuff that you were saying in your podcast about feelings and emotions. And, you know, you would talk about like, in our program, we kind of take it a step further. And so I was like, I, I need that. I think I need that step further, mm-hmm. you know, to yeah. just yeah, be able some... to work through this and not carry the negative with me. Like I knew that I mm-hmm. couldn't carry all the negative with me. Yeah. It's heavy. I think there's so much value in listening to the podcast of course. And also there is something really, really different about hearing it and applying it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like this kind of passive exercise when you're hearing it and it's valuable, but then Mm -hmm. actually asking yourself questions and answering them and looking at where you get stuck and thinking about what you want to create and writing that stuff down is just a whole different level of value in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And knowing like listening to it and then you know, whatever the podcast might be and knowing that there was another level to that and wanting to know what it was Mm -hmm. and knowing like, you know, I need that. I I need, I need to know like what's, what's Mm -hmm. beyond this, what I just listened to for the past 30 minutes. Totally. When Mm -hmm. you said you're a pretty private person, (laughs) Mm -hmm. how did you, how did you navigate that? What was that like? And did you have reservations about coming into a group? I did. Yes, I did. Definitely. It honestly just came down to like, almost like this is my one shot. You know what I mean? I wasn't wanting to be here. So it was like, I need to suck it up and do this Mm -hmm. again. It wasn't even, it wasn't about me at that time. It was like, this is what the boys need. So Mm -hmm. I had big reservations. Yes. But did you have to like pump yourself up to ask for coaching? Because from my end, recalling coaching you, it never Mm -hmm. felt like you did, but I never know what's going on on the other side. Did it require? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it did. Yep. It was like, I would be sweating beforehand. Yeah. And yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. But at the same time, like logically, I knew that's what I needed. I knew that it was good. Like, you know, the benefits outweighed the panic and anxiety of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It you actually know. wasn't going to kill you, even yeah. though part right. of your body. <laughs> yes. Responds. But that whole like being on the hot seat is definitely. <laughs> yeah. You know, those emotions with it, the vulnerability is, mm-hmm. is there, but worth it. Yeah. I'm glad. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that's true mm-hmm. for you. I still find that to be the case for me sometimes when I'm getting coached in a group environment, but way less now. I think it's probably because I don't have so many judgments about the craziness that goes on in my brain. Mm-hmm. I've just realized like all of that is just part of being human. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not showing somebody something that's awful. Right. I'm just showing something that's human and getting Mm -hmm. some support around it. So, so thinking about like you in the early days, because I always imagine women are listening that are, are, you know, maybe earlier in their grief than you are knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself looking back? How would you support yourself in terms of advice you would give yourself looking back? I think just like giving myself grace to that where I was at at that moment was okay you know Mm -hmm. whether it was because I was breaking down from the heartache or you know I had a lot of I struggled a lot with 
handling the boys. And I, Mm -hmm. you know, was always felt like I was a a patient person beforehand and just felt on edge all the time and so Mm -hmm. impatient. And so I would spiral because I would snap and then I would judge myself and feel so guilty. Like they just lost their mom and here I am. And so I think just a big thing is just grace. Like that was, I mean, that's a hard, horrible thing to go through and recognizing that I was doing the best that I could at that Mm -hmm. moment with what I had. I mean, you can't prepare for it. So yeah. And I had, I had people that were able to like say, we want to offer whatever we can, you know, we want to be here, take the boys, like be here with you and the boys in whatever mindset you're in. And that was huge for me that like, if you just want to watch a movie and not talk at all, like, that's fine. Like, we don't expect you to, if we come over and have a play date with the boys, like, that was huge. Wow. And that is like, and I think that like women that come into that would be one thing I'd say, if you can find those people that are yeah. like, it's okay to like, we're just here. We're not, we don't need to talk. You don't need to talk. They're not trying to fix you or make you be. Yeah, different. but just being a presence, just mm-hmm. being a presence, a body in a room, like mm-hmm. is, is huge, huge. For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love what you said too about the spiral of snapping and then judging yourself and then spiraling. And just to be able to stop that with the judgment. We don't even have to stop it. I think most people think, well, the only way I can feel better is if I stop snapping, right? If I suddenly mm-hmm. become super patient. And yeah, maybe we can do some work on that. But like the first step is, can we just be kind to ourselves and, Mm -hmm. you know, compassionate after we snap instead of turning it into, I'm a terrible parent and, you know, the spiral. Yeah. Yeah. So what else shifted for you? I also remember you saying, or maybe it's something you wrote about feeling like the color had been taken and wanting it to be more than shades of gray. Do you remember saying that? No, I I do like I used to I would say that I felt like like life was you know looking at your your cell phone screen with it always on dim, you know, mm-hmm. like it's daytime yet your screen's always at its lowest and so you you know can't quite see everything. I think the biggest a big huge shift for me I was really stuck on the fact that Sarah was the best thing that ever happened to me you know, and I can't have a a better life because having a better life means that she wasn't getting something from me Mm. and she didn't deserve that. And so I was really, really stuck on, on that. And I was able to make the shift of reaching out to her was the best decision that I ever made. And it doesn't change the story. It doesn't change anything, but it gave the power to myself that, you know, I made that decision to reach out to her and look what came out of it. And, you know, it just seems like semantics, but just that different change in perspective was like huge for me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that. And like with the boys, I had a lot of overwhelm and just feeling like come home and do the same thing. And like, you know, the routine of it Mm -hmm. and just hating it. And like, this is my life and feeling like things weren't fair and this is not how it's supposed to be. And I remember coaching through that and you were like, you know, it's a, you know, it's a choice. Like you don't have to do the homework with the boys. And I was like, yeah, but if I don't do it, then like they're getting penalized because they're going to school without their work done. And it was Mm -hmm. like, you know, you said, I'm not telling you, you don't have to, but it's recognizing that it's a choice. Like you don't have to, but you are. And that was, yeah huge for me that, you know, I was like a lot of, I have to do this. I have to do that. You know, I have to make them dinner. I have to get their stuff ready. I have to, and I didn't, I didn't Mm -hmm. have to, that was a huge thing for me that it was a choice. I was choosing to do those things. And so that was very empowering as well. And a big mind shift for me. I love that. That, Yeah. Yeah. Like why not be honest? with ourselves, instead of telling ourselves we have to do it, be honest with ourselves Mm -hmm. and claim that we're choosing to do it and like take the credit for that amazing choice that we're making. feels completely different than Mm -hmm. being the victim of all the amazing things we're choosing to do. Right. Yeah. Because truthfully, you could just like leave them on the street. (laughs) 
Right. Yeah, exactly. I didn't have to feed you them. They could have, they could <laughs> right. have eaten whatever they could reach, yeah. <laughs> whatever was at their height. Yeah. To grab off yeah. the counter. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck <laughs> yeah. to you. Yeah. What was it you were saying before? I want to, I want to, I had a thought and that's escaped me. Oh, you're talking about not looking forward to, you know, the monotony of it too, which I also think is really common. And, and I've noticed that it's a place where we seem to judge ourselves. Like we tell ourselves we're supposed to look forward to it or that we shouldn't be dreading it or shouldn't be not looking forward to it. And Mm -hmm. I think it's such an act of kindness when we can just give ourselves permission to feel how we feel. Like it's totally Mm -hmm. okay to dread it, not look forward to it, not love it. Like, why is that not okay? Right. Right. The crap comes when we're like, and you shouldn't. But, Mm -hmm. but in that moment you do like, what if we just allowed ourselves to feel how we felt without telling ourselves we're wrong? Right. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah, Cause who said it's supposed to be amazing all the time? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Cause it's not, (laughs) it's not. And that's with one parent, two parents, right. Yeah. Some drama, no drama. I mean, that's just being a parent, right. And being Mm -hmm. a human, it's just not always something that we love. It's 50, 50 at least for Mm -hmm. most of us anyway. Yeah. Anything else you want other people to know? I just can't say enough about your program and what you're, what you're doing in general. I mean, for me coming into it, you know, it was like, okay, month one, we're going to work on feelings. I'm like, oh God, shut the binder, put it aside, like feelings for a whole month. Like, I can't, <laughs> I'm not yeah. happy to you know. Um, <laughs> I had times during the six months where I wished that the stuff that I had worked on and learned, I had known when Sarah was here mm. because I would have been able to like help her in situations I wish I had known this a long time ago, like some mm-hmm. of this stuff with feelings and thoughts as objects and being able to like put them down and set them aside. I mean, mm-hmm. I joined in August and so November was a year and I can confidently say that that first death anniversary and then like after that is Thanksgiving, two weeks after that is my son's birthday, two weeks after that is Christmas, two weeks, like it's just until yeah. February with Sarah's birthday and my birthday would have been a completely different experience. What do you think changed about it? How was it different than you think it otherwise would have been? I think I didn't judge myself. I allowed the feelings. Like I knew that going into it, it's going to be a hard day. I'm going to have feel X, Y, and Z and it's Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm going to let that happen. That was big. And just how do you think you would have approached it before? Would it have been like there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it? No, I I think it was just would have been a lot more overwhelming. I think Mm -hmm. I would have not allowed whatever surface to surface like it did. I think I would have had some judgment of myself. Um, However, it was that I would have reacted, I would have Mm -hmm. judged myself and you know, I should be doing this or I shouldn't be doing this. And I was just able to whatever came up, whatever feelings, whatever emotions, that was okay. And I was, Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's been very helpful with my boys. Like a lot of what I've learned, being able to apply it with them and like feel like I'm giving them a leg up because they're not going to learn this stuff about feelings and emotions when they're, you know, 38, they're going to get it now. Mm -hmm. So that's applicable, not just because you know, I lost the love of my life, but it's just applicable to my life in general. Yeah. You know? And it does seem that a lot of people are surprised about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I wonder why that is. Do you kind of imagine it's just going to be grief and sadness? Or maybe, I guess, in your words, instead of trying to ask you the right question, in your words, what's different about it than maybe what you expected it to be? I don't even know if I can answer that. I mean, I guess that like not knowing what I learned with all the feelings and emotions, I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. Really, you know? (laughs) So this is for widowed moms. So I I figured that, well, this is going to help me get to where I need to be, but Mm -hmm. didn't necessarily realize that it's helpful in so many different areas. I think it's going to just be like grief, parenthood, and then you you see Mm -hmm. applications and like, oh no, actually it's like so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I love it. Oh, I was curious to know, like, how are your boys doing? Then you don't have to share anything more than what you want, but. They're doing good. I'm kind of jealous because at that age, kids are selfish, (laughs) you know, like they're very self-centered. They're about them, which is like for something like this is 
I think, a blessing because they can compartmentalize. They're not mm-hmm. thinking about, you know, mom died like every minute of every day, like I am, you know, it mm-hmm. comes in like spurts, you know, but then they're just back in their world and they're with their friends and then in their like routine. So I'm thankful for that at their age that they were just able to like if I kept them in school and Mm -hmm. whatever, you know, but they're doing well. I'm curious to see as they get older and have more of a deeper understanding. You know, my youngest is four when it happened. And so as he gets older and kind of has a better understanding of like what it means, you know, that Mm -hmm. he lost his mom and realizing like what he might have missed out on, like how that shifts as they get older but Mm -hmm. yeah how do you kind of you know keep her memory how do you weave her into life in your house and talk about her all the time i've got pictures i've created started with the boys like memory boxes so they each Mm -hmm. have a box and we've gone through started going through pictures and so i just print off like we go through and like They pick what pictures they want. And as I get them, I write on the back kind of when it was, what's a place. And it's just things that come up. You know, mom's so proud of you for doing this. You know, she's still proud of you. She still sees this. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what mom used to do. And and they will, they'll be like, yeah, mom, oh, snakes. Mom didn't like snakes. She wouldn't Mm -hmm. like this show. And, you know, Mm -hmm. just little things like that. Or, oh, remember, this is mom's favorite meal. So just always talking about her and what was she like oh she was I mean if you can imagine the kindest most compassionate person that was her she had the biggest heart she was an advocate for people with disabilities Mm -hmm. and so she was always like finding ways to help people and just the most caring person you would ever ever meet and I see that in my older son so my older son, she gave birth to, and then I gave birth to my younger son, mm-hmm. and they have the same sperm donor, so they're biologically brothers. Love it. But I see a lot of those things in my older son, and so I yeah. often tell him, like, you remember how kind mom was, and she had the biggest heart and was so generous, and I said, you have those too, mm-hmm. you know, and like, so being able to share that with, you know, you've got her smile, and mm-hmm. Yeah. I love it. I wonder if your youngest son, that would be an interesting thing to navigate. I wonder if there will be differences in the connection that he feels at some point than your older one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder that. I I feel like it'll come down to what he remembers because he had a pretty special connection with her. Like they, and I always used to say, well, I mean, her and I connected. So of course she would connect with (laughs) you know, the one I gave birth to because he's a lot like me. But yeah, I thought that. And I think just helping him remember like the things that the special bond that they had. Yeah. And they did have. And the idea that connection isn't like connection is something we cultivate, right? It's something Mm -hmm. that, that we, based on how we think we create. So Mm -hmm. empowering him to know that there really is no difference in terms of his ability to connect with her and your oldest's ability to connect with Mm -hmm. her. It's it's all, you know, what he chooses to believe and planting some of those, you know, loving thoughts that she had about him. So what's next for you? Actually, I have started seeing someone. Mm -hmm. And so that's, yeah, that's been a big step for me and has been, it's pretty new, but has been a big Mm -hmm. I can say if it wasn't for this work that I've done, I would not Mm -hmm. be here. And I've had a whole lot of emotions and feelings and feelings of guilt and judgment and that I'm worked through. I'm still working through. So that's been, (laughs) that's been something new to navigate and Mm -hmm. like knowing what I've learned with feelings and like, it's a feeling, not a belief. It's not a truth Mm -hmm. um, has been, yeah, has been big and if I'm thinking other people were thinking it, then you used to say that that it's probably because I'm thinking about myself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, worried other people are going to judge you in the same way that you're most likely Mm -hmm. judging yourself. Yeah. 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 So So it sounds like you've been able to coach yourself pretty well. Yeah. I have when I can do it, like I I can feel that I'll get into situations and I just, I I need to stop myself and Mm -hmm. like 
sit down and write and, you know, get those thoughts out and see that this is a thought and now, you mm-hmm. know, where's that coming from and what am I telling myself about it? Mm-hmm. Good. Music to my ears. Mm-hmm. D- did you have some tools you can pull out of your toolbox and help yourself after the program? That's what I want. Yeah, that's huge is having that tool. And so that's where like, yeah, listening to the podcast was great. Like it made me feel not so isolated, but I wouldn't be where I am right now if that's all I did was listen to the podcast. Like, you know, I needed that. I needed that other work. I'm glad you were willing to do that for yourself Mm -hmm. and to put yourself in a position which didn't sound like it was super comfortable. (laughs) No, no. For the person who's, it wasn't. Who, nope. who's private and doesn't really want to talk in front yes, of others yes, to come yep. in and do that. It's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. And I have to say, like, I also had some reservations with the fact that it wasn't my husband. It was my mm. wife, my mm-hmm. partner. And so that's all like, you don't know how people might respond or how that might be. And, you know, I did not feel like, I mean love is love and grief is grief, really, you know, like it's didn't matter that she was a woman and it was a a man for everybody else. Like the emotions were still the same. What we went through is still exactly the same. You know, our feelings are everything. And so I'm, I'm glad that I, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that that too. Mm -hmm. It's it's always one of those things that I've been like, okay, how can I create that culture where, because I know where I am, but just because I'm where I am doesn't mean the people who want to be in my program share the same, you know, beliefs right. and values. And right. So it's it's interesting to trust in a culture you have hopefully created and mm-hmm. then watch just to make sure. But right. I'm, glad that's, yes. I'm glad that's the experience yes. you have because that's the experience that I want. I want everybody to feel welcome. If you identify as a woman and you identify as a widow, which there's a lot of nuance in there, right? Mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. that's the environment that I want people to feel good yeah. at. How was it watching other people's coaching? That was so helpful. I mean, I mean, I I didn't have the one, I've never done the one-on-one therapy, but like mm-hmm. being the one getting coached, you know, is you're in the hot seat and your yeah. mind is like spinning and you're just able to step back when somebody else is doing it and you're able to like make the connections better and, mm-hmm. and see things kind of more clearly because you're not feeling as vulnerable and yeah. And so many things like, Oh yeah. Yep. I didn't even realize that I have that too. You know, like mm-hmm. I have those same thoughts and like, it's, it's okay. It's normal to have those thoughts. Like I'm not alone. I it's love huge. when I hear that. Cause it's like, there's no yeah. amount of convincing. I can seem to be able to do sometimes with people who are just hell bent on, I need your attention one-on-one. I'm like, no, you actually don't. You think mm-hmm. you do. Mm-hmm. And there's, you'll get plenty of it if you want it. And also there's so much value. in when your fear brain is not right yep. on the defense or blurring things for you. And there's so much value in going, oh, it's not a me problem, right? It's like, a, that's mm-hmm. what's going on in people's brains. It's a thought problem. It's a feeling issue. There's nothing fundamentally flawed with me. She's struggling the same way I'm struggling. I get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so yeah. Weird. And to see like, I mean, and I think that for me, that's what like the model does is it helps me because when you're in it, you're not seeing anything else, but what's in your brain. And so right. to do this, you're able to step outside of your brain and like yeah. see it from that outside perspective. And when yeah. you're not the one being coached, you're the one watching it is the same thing. Like you can mm-hmm. see, you know, it seems so you obvious get, when you, it's not your yeah. life, doesn't it? You're like yes, looking at the yeah. other person. You're yeah, like, and you're, yep. oh, I totally see. Yeah. Yeah. It's like watching a TV show and being like, why are they making that decision? Like, that doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. But yeah. like, you know, when you're in it, you're just, that's yeah. where your focus is. What you're believing is a truth and you can't get past it. And so that was big to be able to learn from others' mm-hmm. vulnerabilities, basically. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. And the more people put themselves in uncomfortable positions and ask for coaching, when it's uncomfortable or, you know, when it's a subject that they're uncomfortable with, it's so Mm -hmm. life-giving to everyone else in the group. Mm -hmm. Because then it makes you want to get help or, you know, you're like, ah, me too. It's a lot of too many. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yes. Thank you for having me. Is there anything we missed? I don't think so. I guess I would just like to comment also for me, if anybody is, is thinking of doing it, like definitely is user-friendly in the sense of like, a busy mom. I mean, I wish I could have been more like 
online, like, you know, like when people are chatting in Slack or like have been more involved with the live coaching calls instead of having to watch the replays. Mm -hmm. But the fact that I was able to do all of this because of those options, you know, like I had to get the boys to school and then work. And then for me, it was after they went to bed at you mm-hmm. know 10 o'clock at night is when I would do it. And so that's very user friendly. Isn't really the right term that I want to use, but just, no, but I get it as workable. You can actually yes, do it. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You can and like, I remember in, you'd be like you can fit calling it in. in from your car, like, you know, Yep. Mm-hmm. yeah. Good. That's yeah, what that I want. Makes, that makes a big difference. Yes. I just I just actually got an email from somebody this morning who's like, I want to join, but I want to attend the calls live. I don't think it's going to be valuable for me if I don't attend the calls live. And every time somebody says that, I'm like, I get what you're saying. And also mm-hmm. I have a hundred examples of how you don't actually have to come live, but it's hard to get people to see that. So thank you for saying it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So good. All right. Keep in touch. I will. Thank you okay. so much. Take care. You're welcome. If you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and want to create a future you can truly get excited about even after the loss of your spouse, I invite you to join my Mom Goes On coaching program. It's small group coaching just for widowed moms like you, where I'll help you figure out what's holding you back and give you the tools and support you need so you can move forward with confidence. Please don't settle for a new normal that's less than what you deserve. Go to coachingwithkrista.com and click work with me for details and next steps. I can't wait to meet you.